Next on the program, Professor Mark Maslin speak on human evolution in the Garden of Eden, giant lakes, orbital forcing, and the evolution of the genus Homo. Mark. Thank you much, Fred. First, I'd like to say thank you to friends and colleagues who have contributed to this. Um, all the blame, of course, is mine, but their data has been used. What I want to do is introduce you to the East African Rift Valley. This is where humans evolved. And I summed it up once by saying I am not surprised that humans evolved in East Africa because over the last 10 million years, everything about this continent has changed. So if we look at the East African Rift system, we can look, it's a triple junction, it's where uh, there's rifting going on at the moment, and it's where you have the Gulf of Aden, you've got the Red Sea, and then here you've got what we're interested in, which is the East African Rift. Now, if we look at the dating of this, about 14 to 20 million years we had rifting in uh, northern Ethiopia, about 12 to 7 million years we have northern uh, Kenya, Nine to six, we have the western side of the uh, Kenyan Rift, and then about 5.5 to 3.7 million years with the eastern side. Now, the take home message from this is that tectonics in East Africa goes from north to south. And I just want you to put that at the back of your mind because I'm going to come back to it to justify some of my paleoclimate work. So this just to give you some pretty pictures. This is, of course, the full Graben formation in southern Kenya, just to show you the scale that we're talking about. And this is the inner rift. That's a car down there, about the size of the pinprint there. So these are the sort of scale of features that have occurred over the last 5 to 10 million years in East Africa. Now, just uh, for interest's sake, the interesting thing is that um, the rifting of the East African uh, valley has ceased this, of course, is continuing, and this is classic for triple junctions. What happens is you have three ways of rifting, and then two ways. These two are still expanding, the Red Sea is expanding, and so Arabia is still moving away from East Africa. But the uh, rifting in this uh, region has actually uh, stopped, and there's a slow pull to the northwest uh, and to the southeast, and that's about it. So rifting has actually died in this region. Now, what's the effect of rifting on East Africa? If we go back 20 million years, we have a nice, flat continent. If you can imagine that continent looking like South America, flat, relatively flat, and therefore not much uh, climate change here. We have this hot spot causing bulging, and then starting this rifting and having these massive mountain areas. Now, these mountain areas can be up to two to three kilometers high in parts. Now, that's a lot of relief to have in a continental area. Changes in climate are huge. Here we have lots of nice rain about 20 million years ago in East Africa. We start to get about 10 million years ago some sort of change. We're starting to get some sort of rain shadow on either side. And then here, about 5 million years, we have the plateau opening up. You have major rain shadows on both sides for the moisture coming from the Congo and the moisture coming from the Indian Ocean. And most importantly, this mountain range acts as an accelerator for the Finlater jet, and basically all the moisture passes East Africa and zooms off to India in the form of the monsoons. So this makes a radical change to the climate of East Africa. And this is the sort of classical view of the changes in vegetation, lots of nice rainforest, lots of nice rainforest with a bit of grass, and then lots of grass and broken uh, fragments. And some of my colleagues uh, in paleoanthropology have uh, argued that sort of perhaps that actually influenced human evolution. Now, all I want you to take away from this is that mountain regions have very complicated climate. So we go from an area similar to the Amazon rainforest where you have very similar climate and vegetation. Over 20 million years, you go to a period where you have very complicated uh, landscape and topography, and you have a complicated climate. Now, so why did uh, the uh, human genus Homo appear? And why did our brain expand? And that's what I'm going to try and pick on from the climate point of view. Now, to start off with, we've got to see where we've been. This is uh, North Africa, there's Spain and Portugal, and this 
is actually a dust cloud blowing off the Sahara, which has been picked up by a satellite by NASA. And where we were about 10 years ago was that Peter Dominical published a, a seminal paper in Science that showed from uh, uh, ancient soils that East Africa had dried out, and from the dust records from the oceans, you can see lots of variability, but he seemed to see three periods where, as the climate cooled into sort of, uh, this uh, long cooling period, there were periods of drying. And so for 10 years, we've had this sort of like uh, paradigm that East Africa got drier, it suddenly got even drier, humans then were stressed, and therefore they evolved. And this happened three times. And that was fine. However, I come from a background of paleoceanography, and I know about ocean sediments. I also know if you drill in the Indian Ocean, you have a two-kilometer high mountain range between you and what you really want to know, which is what was the climate of the Rift Valley. So we started investigating the actual Rift Valley and looking at lakes. So these are the different basins that we've looked at. And this is the modern satellite image. And here's Lake Tacana. Here's uh, Lake Navasha, and that's Boingo. And so we started to investigate the fossil uh, lakes that we knew were there. This is Lake Karinduzi. It's dated about one million years ago. And this is this pure white sediment that's laid down. And it has these microfossils, which is about one microns across. And what's interesting is to get these fossils and this pure whiteness means that you had a really deep lake in this area. It must have been about two to 300 meters deep and pure fresh water. Here we have Lake uh, Gishiro, which is uh, about 1.7 million years, and you can see these beautiful exposures. The reason why we have beautiful exposures is because it's mined. Any of you had Coke or any fizzy drink at lunchtime, you're pleased to know that all those lovely impurities have been filtered out through the diatomite that's been mined from East Africa. So these give you beautiful sections to be able to date and, again, show these wonderful uh, diatoms that show you how deep and fresh these lakes were. And they're very extensive. So we put this together, uh, and Martin Trout put this all together for science, and what we found was, when you look at all the basins, and this is from Odavai all the way to Afar in Ethiopia, and you put all these basins together, you can start to pick out where these lakes actually occur. And so here we have a set of lakes about one million years ago that occur in numerous basins. And this is where I said, put that memory of tectonics. If tectonics was driving this, you would expect that lakes would start here, and then they would move through down this way if the lakes were tectonically driven. They're not. They're coeval in time, so we have a climate signal in East Africa. We also have one about here, about two, uh, two million years ago. Also, you have four basins that pick up this signal, and then we have about two and a half million years again, same signal. And here, look. Just pick out, they actually do coincide with some of the species. So, I've taken this from Bernard Woods, so any blame of the uh, names is all his, because uh, I'm a climatologist, not an anthropologist. So, how does this relate? These three periods of time, the first one here relates to the onset of northern hemisphere glaciation. About two and a half million years ago, suddenly big ice sheets started. And by big, I mean about three kilometers thick of ice over Chicago. These are big ice sheets that start in the Northern Hemisphere, and it kicks off a period of global cooling. And it does sort of tie in with a few of these species. About two million years ago, we had the development of the Walker circulation. So prior to that period of time, the whole idea of having the El Nino uh, circulation would not have occurred, and we have a very strong east-to-west circulation in the tropics that starts about two million years ago. Again, a part of this long-term cooling through this period of time. And then here we have the mid-Pleistocene revolution about one million years ago. Up to this point, from the onset of Northern Hemisphere glaciation to this period, the ice ages have come every 41,000 years beautifully cyclic, coming and going. After this revolution, they come every 100,000 years, they get deeper, they get harsher, and they get stronger in the amount of ice volume. So, I put this up, wet 
not arid periods correspond to human evolution. This is Martin Trout's paper in Science. And again, somebody picked up on this in the morning. I got into a lot of trouble about this as I went to meetings like this because people started to accuse me of saying that it was wet and that's what caused human evolution. It's because they hadn't read the paper. Okay? And I heard this uh, mentioned this morning. If you read the paper, it doesn't say that. So, and I'll tell you what the paper does say in a moment. So, we have periods of wetness or big lakes where you have brain expansion about two and a half million years ago with bigger brains. We also have bigger teeth. And I'm going to come back to that because if it's wet and it's nice conditions, why have we got bigger teeth being involved in certain aspects as well? And then again, we have even bigger brains and change in stone tool use. So I could leave it here and say, hey, look, we had lovely big lakes, humans evolved by these lakes, and it was the Garden of Eden. I wish I could do that. Unfortunately, life is a little bit more complicated than that. And so what the paper did try to say was that these lakes are ephemeral. We know this is Lake Baringo. This is the work of John Kingston that's just about to come out in the Journal of Human Evolution. And here we have this layer of lake sediments. And there are a sequence of five lake sequences, all beautifully up this sequence, which have been dated by Argon Argon. And they occur about every 20,000 years. So they are cyclic. So it adds, and we said this in the paper, we think these lakes are ephemeral. Now, this all relates back to orbital forcing. Now, we have three components to the orbital forcing, all of which are where the Earth wobbles around the Sun in different ways, changing about the amount of energy that the Earth receives. The only one you need to concentrate on is the one up here, which is insulation, which is the amount of Sun's energy received. And this is I picked on the 21st of March at the equator. And the way to imagine that is, imagine you pick on your graduate student, don't, not an undergraduate, you want somebody reliable. Pick on, pick on your graduate student, you put them in a time machine, and you send them back to the equator every year for 8 million years. And they have a light meter. They go, oh yeah, okay, measure the sun. This is exactly the record you would get. The amount of sun's energy at March actually changes by a huge amount. So at the equator, over 8 million years, it changes by 20% or 90 watts per square meter, which is a huge amount. And that's because the wobble changes the seasonality. So even if we didn't have the tectonics, even if we didn't have all those major global climate changes, the tropics is a highly variable place purely because of wobbles in the Earth's orbit. I always put this up when there's a supercomputer. So colleague of mine, Amy Clement, from uh, Miami, has used a supercomputer model to look at what happens to rainfall when you have an ice age and a modern period, and this is the change in rainfall. And then all she did was change the procession, which is this 21,000-year wobble, which changes the seasonality of the tropics. And look at this. Almost the same order of magnitude as a full ice age. So just by wobbling the earth and changing the seasonality in the tropics, you can change the rainfall by as much as an ice age. This is just to show you what a full ice age looks like. So we have a way of changing rainfall patterns over East Africa very, very significantly. And the other thing I like to sort of like debase another myth is that everybody assumes that orbital forcing, because it's nice and smooth and it's sinusoidal, is of course is going to be slow and won't have any thresholds. However, if you look at any sine curve, for most of the sine curve here, 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 absolutely nothing happens, or very little happens. With a sine curve, all the change happens in these little bits here and here. So here and here and here, and this is the rate of change, you can have 30% of the whole variation in about 2,000 years. So you have, just by orbital forcing, a way of changing the local environment incredibly quickly, despite it looking like a nice, smooth curve. So it looks like we have huge fluctuations in East African climate. We have Eden, and then we have drought. And there seems to be a variation between these two on an orbital time scale, and therefore pretty quick. 
And this is where I have to take most of the blame because we've put these together. And these are now covering the last five million years. This is the wobble of the Earth, just to pick out the p key periods where you get major changes. These are the big global climatic changes, onset of northern hemisphere glaciation, development of the Walker circulation, mid-Pleistocene revolution. And also here, these are when there's major ice rafting, so there's big ice sheets in both Greenland and Antarctica, and there's a change in ocean circulation. And they all seem to tie up. Here we have East African lakes and where they occur in the record, Mediterranean dust, which also gives you another moisture record. And this is the slow drying curve from the soils. And this is, of course, the different species of uh, hominins that have evolved in East Africa or have been described in East Africa. Now, what we think happens is that we have these distinct packages of periods of time where you have extreme variable climate in East Africa. So if we were going about 1.5 million years, East African climate is actually quite dull, not a lot happens. However, once you get into one of these periods, you get incredibly wet and incredibly dry periods alternating on orbital timescales. What we think happens is when you have major cooling here and lots of sea ice here and here, you have the intertropical convergence zone in the tropics being squeezed. What it means is all that moisture can't escape to India or Arabia, and it has to be trapped and kept in East Africa here. So it means that you have a way of getting lots of water very quickly to build these incredibly deep lakes, giving this huge environmental change. But I would love to be able to end this by saying this is a feed complete. There are, we have uh, major climate change, orbital forcing, we have these highly variable periods where you have lakes coming and going, and that lake coming and going, that's the environmental stress. However, I thought because we're going on to a workshop that I should actually open Pandora's box and be a little bit more honest. <laughs> There's always a first, isn't there? Here's the dust record. Here's the uh, solar insulation. And this is three models of what the lakes could or could not be doing. Okay? We know there are lakes there, and we have some feel about how long they stay in the landscape. So here we have the model, smooth model. So the lakes come, stay, slowly leave. So there isn't really much there to force evolution, unless you say, actually, when you have these big deep lakes, you have high energy, you have wet periods, perhaps there's a lot of interspecies competition, you can invoke the Red Queen hypothesis, perhaps that causes evolution. Or we could go back to the old model, which says, hey, look, we have these extreme dry periods every so often, and that must be where those big teeth were required, as well as the bigger brain. Perhaps it's actually not the lakes, it's these very dry periods that actually cause evolution. It's that stress. Second model is the high stress dry periods where you have these lakes and they suddenly disappear, suddenly appear, and it's that threshold that suddenly throws all of the uh, environment into chaos and causes evolution. My favorite, though I'm not yet have the evidence to prove it, is variability where you have massive variability, lakes coming, going, coming, going, coming, going, and then finally they're there, and then lots and lots of noise, and then they disappear. And it's this period here where those lakes are actually coming, going, coming, going, coming, going very rapidly to a point where they then exist. And then you do this in packages of five or six during these highly variable periods, which you have successive stresses to cause evolution. Of course, after these six, everything calms down again and nothing happens. And what's interesting is that if you look at the dates of the species appearance in East Africa, and I know people are going to say, ooh, but each one of those is incredibly dodgy. That's fine. If you look at it, 15, uh, 12 out of the 15 defined species that I found in the literature um, coincide with these periods of packages of highly variable climate, which only make up about 20% of the total climate of East Africa. So percentage games, 80% occur during 20%. I think I'm on to a winning percentage game there. So conclusions. 
Tectonics. Please don't forget about tectonics. Tectonics provides the dynamic topography of East Africa, and it provides that climate sensitivity. If you did not have those mountains in the way to cause there to be that microfabric of climatology, you wouldn't get this variability. Climate in East Africa is dominated by the appearance and disappearance of lakes. Okay? These are huge lakes. I cannot get across to you until I take people and go, that's a lake, how big they are. Global climate changes are a key. You need to have these global climate changes, stresses from the high latitudes, to actually influence the tropics before you get these uh, lakes coming and going. Precession, again, the timing of tropical uh, climate is processionally driven, and it allows you to have these Garden of Edens that occur every so often. And as I said, oh, I've changed it. It's 13 out of 15. There are, not 12. 13 out of 15, because I've probably shifted one of the points slightly. 13 out of the 15 first appearances seem to be during these high periods of climate change. I hope that's given you a different perspective on the emergence of HOMO. Thank you. Carrying on with this afternoon's themes of broad issues and broad tissues, we have <laughs> Leslie Ayala talking to us about expensive tissues, energetics, and the evolution of the genus HOMO. Leslie. Okay. So, uh, thank you very much. I'd like to join uh, everybody and thank the organizers for putting such a wonderful event together. But I, I want to offer a minor correction to, to Richard, because he, he gave the impression that the Venner Grand Foundation has stopped organizing conferences, workshops, and symposia. And that's absolutely not the case in the castle. Uh, the foundation sold the castle in the late 1970s because it was driving the foundation out of business. It was so expensive. But uh, th th this year we'll be organizing our 140th uh, working symposium. Uh, the only difference between us and what's going on here is we service all of anthropology, social anthropology, linguistics, the whole lot. And what's so wonderful about the Stony Brook meetings is that year on year, we follow the uh, major happenings in human evolution. And that's terribly important for the development of the field. And the Venner Grand Foundation is very uh, pleased to have been able to support uh, this conference. OK, now I've been asked to talk about expensive tissues, energetics, and the evolution of the genus Homo. Now, this is going to be a slightly different talk than some of the ones we've had before. Because uh, what I'm going to do is try to pull evidence from a lot of different areas and uh, begin to put flesh on the bones of these early ancestors and talk about what the implications of some of the morphological changes that we see throughout the record are. Now, in order to do this, uh, I have to make a few assumptions. And uh, the first one of these assumptions is that we have constraining rela relationships or trade-offs in terms of how energy is invested in growth, maintenance, activity, or reproduction. So you can choose to spend your energy on reproduction, long life. Uh, there's trade-offs that we have in evolution. Uh, also, natural selection operates very strongly on all of these trade-offs. And uh, what the uh, overall benefit is, is uh, your lifetime reproductive success. So what's important in human evolution is getting your genes into the next generation. And uh, the features should only be selected for when the cost-benefit ratio is optimal. OK, so there, th this is where we're starting from. Now, uh, it's also important to know what we actually know about human evolution, where our starting point in making these inferences are. And we've seen various charts like this um, uh, throughout the, the, the day, seven million years ago on up to the present. Green here, of course, are the robust australopithecines, the big tooth ones. Red are Homo agaster and more recent Homo. Now, as we heard from Mark uh, just before coffee, uh, we also have climatic change happening throughout this time period. So whatever is happening in human evolution is happening against the background of major changes in the environment or habitat that our early ancestors were living in and coping with. Now, uh, we, we also know something about the fossils. And one of the most stunning fossils, of course, is uh, the uh, Homo agaster relatively complete skeleton. And we, we, when this was discovered, uh, what was important about it, it was that it was so complete 
but it was also in a way unexpected. It was so big in body size, and it also had very human-like limber portions with the very long legs. Now, if you contrast the, the, this against the other complete skeleton that we uh, have is uh, Lucy Australopithecus afarensis coming in here. And Lucy is actually much smaller in body size with much different body proportions. So if you compare these two, and th th this set drawing is sort of scale that really hits you with what the extreme difference between Ergaster and Lucy is representative of Australopithecus actually is. And the main question that nobody ever really asks in the field is why do you have such an increase in body size? Now, the, uh, I know that recently we have uh, indications of many smaller bodied fossils that could belong to Ergaster or Erectus, but we do have evidence of these large bodied individuals. So what does large body size do for you? There's a number of advantages, particularly in the context of thermal regulation and water budgets. Uh, in terms of water budgets, you need more water to support this large body, but you can go longer between water holes. So you have a much greater probability of not suffering from dehydration. Uh, you also have, in terms of thermal re regulation, something that hasn't previously really been emphasized the, in the field. And the thermal regulation may have been very important to pregnant females, because if you're living in a very hot environment, and in the later stages of pregnancy, when your uh, body mass increases in relation to your stature, th this could actually be a very important thing. And again, the larger the body size you have, uh, the better you're able to cope with these uh, situations. Now, uh, you also have the capacity to exploit broad, broader dietary niches, eat wider ranges of food, greater mobility, prey size, increased sociality. And again, something that hasn't been really emphasized is that you can more efficiently carry larger weights, particularly kids, uh, into a, low, uh, a higher body weight. Uh, and uh, th this is particularly important when it comes to, uh, to the fact of sort of thinking about how our ancestors were actually living in terms of the type of diet uh, and how this affected the younger individuals. And I'll come back to this uh, in a minute. Now, if you also look at body size differences, in the Australopithecines, we think that we have a much higher degree of body size dimorphism. And here are modern humans as a comparison. And our traditional view of Homo erectus or Homo agaster is that the sexual size dimorphism is also decreased. Now, th th this has uh, actually very important consequences because in terms of body mass, a Homo erectus female would be 65 to 66% heavier in weight than an average Australopithecine female, where a male would only be about 44 to 45% heavier than an average Australopithecine uh, male. And uh, in terms of the amount of energy you would actually use, your DEE is your daily uh, uh, energy expenditure. Uh, the females would have a much higher daily energy expenditure in relation to an equivalent Australopithecine female than a male would. So both the males and females increased in size, the, but the females increased much more, and the effect on their energy budget would have been much more than the male. So body size uh, and a reduction in sexual size dimorphism. Now, how do you cope with this? Uh, just if you have an increase in body size, you need more food, or you need to increase the quality of your food. Uh, both of the uh, situations could have happened. But if you're uh, supporting such a large body mass on the same type of diet that uh, the Australopithecines ate, you would basically have to eat for a longer time period. And this gets you into time budget problems because uh, if we can use, say, chimpanzees for an example, they spend a tremendously large proportion of their, uh, of their daylight hours actually eating. And if you have to eat that much more to support a large body mass, you're going to be in trouble. You won't have to, uh, time left over for socialization and this type of thing. Uh, the alternative uh, is to increase the quality of the diet. And we have some uh, evidence of this just by looking at the relative size of the teeth. And that this is an old diagram that comes from one of Henry McHenry's papers from 1984 
where he simply plotted tooth area against body mass. And you have gorillas here, humans here, chimps, pygmy chimps here. Here are all of your Australopithecines. They're megadont. And uh, here's uh, Homo habilis, uh, slightly smaller teeth. And Homo erectus agaster falls closer to, to the line. Now, the, there was a question uh, earlier on about what is the difference between two size? Does this really indicate a difference in diet? The answer is yes, because corresponding or going along with the change in tooth size, you have an entire change in facial biomechanics. And what the smaller teeth is actually, are actually telling us is the jaw muscles are smaller, uh, you can uh, apply less energy b between those teeth. And also, if you were eating the same diet, those teeth would wear down much more rapidly and wouldn't last you through your lifetime. So uh, the tooth size is showing us that something was going on with the diet as we make the jump into Homo agaster and Homo erectus. Now, we, we can also tell, surprisingly enough, something about diet from brain size. And this is simply a chart of millions of years here, going back to 3.5 up to the present day, uh, and cranial capacity. And you have your Australopithecines here, as we've heard earlier this morning, with cranial capacities around 500 cubic centimeters. This period between 2 and 1.5, you have a jump in cranial capacity. Homo agaster here, and then from about 1.5 into a half million years ago, not much happens. The, the cranial capacity doesn't change very much. After a half a million years ago, it jumps up. Now, there is a very important relationship here with the increase in cranial capacity. And uh, you have, uh, you know, with, um, if you plot simply relative dietary quality against re relative brain size in primates, as uh, the brain size increases, primates have a higher quality diet. But the little point up here is humans. You have a much higher uh, or a much greater increase uh, in the brain size in relation to your dietary quality. And in a way here, humans are also bucking the trend because as body weight increases in most primates, you have a, de uh, uh, a decrease in dietary quality. Here humans are with their, their very large uh, very, very high dietary quality in relation to our brain size. Now, what this is actually saying is that humans have a large brain, and uh, in order to uh, sort of fuel that large brain, you need a much higher quality diet. Now, the, these things uh, led uh, Peter Wheeler and I in the mid-1990s to uh, propose something we call the expensive tissue hypothesis. Uh, this uh, originated with looking at body mass against basal metabolic rate, the energy it takes you to run your body just when you're, when you're in a thermal neutral zone, you aren't di di digesting, that's your basic minimal uh, energy requirements. And here's humans. We have the same basal me metabolic rate that you would expect from your body mass. But if you look at body mass here against brain weight, humans have this extremely large brain size. Now, what we, we would expect is that we would see an increase in our basal metabolic rate to support that large brain size, because your uh, gram of brain tissue takes about 20% um, more uh, uh, energy than a similar gram of muscle tissue. So by having an extra, uh, you know, uh, uh, what, what would it be, a, 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 an extra kilogram of brain mass up there, you would expect that to show up in your basal metabolic rate, and it doesn't. Now, what uh, turns out to, to be the case is that uh, we have uh, in an ancestral uh, primate, or uh, in an average primate of our body mass, uh, we would have a uh, re relatively small brain, but we would also have a relatively big digestive system. And if you look at the proportionality in the humans, uh, you have a very large brain, and you have a correspondingly reduced digestive system. All of the other expensive organs in, in your body are equivalent in size. And it seems that what we gain up here, we have to lose in our digestive system. Now, the, 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 these are masses of these expensive organs. 
But uh, if you look at the actual uh, energetic cost, you find it also balances almost perfectly because the gut is very highly uh, enervated. It's very expensive in metabolic terms. Now, uh, what we were uh, proposing here is that as the brain size increases in humans, you need to evolve a smaller gut if you're going to maintain an uh, average basal metabolic rate. And th this wouldn't be necessary if our ancestors were living in an extremely lush environment where, uh, they, would be, uh, where they, th th they would be able to acquire sufficient food to uh, support an elevated basal metabolic rate. But if we go back to our basic assumptions, uh, this may in fact not have been the case. Now, the only way that you can support a, the evolution of, re, of a reduced gut size is, in fact, to transition to a higher quality diet that you can digest much e uh, easier. And the message from the expansion of tissue hypothesis was that when the brain expands, it needs a higher quality diet, not so much to fuel that brain, but to balance the energetic equation that we see uh, in the body to allow us to have a much smaller gut. And what this, in fact, does uh, is uh, allow us to maintain the growth and development of this large brain without causing a, uh, energet a high energetic cost. Now, uh, what's very interesting about this is recently this has been confirmed also in fish. And uh, I thought that this was uh, quite an interesting example uh, th this is a tropical fish, uh, Gathanemus, and this fish uh, is, spends approximately 60% of its total energy budget on running a very large brain. And if you look at the brain size, gut size relationship in this fish, you see the same payoff as we recognize in humans. Uh, these are uh, other similar fish uh, that uh, have uh, a much uh, l lower uh, brain size where you, you see the reverse pattern. Now, uh, when we originally proposed this hypothesis, uh, we were uh, su suggesting that the high-quality diet was an animal-based diet. And we were using the body proportion differences that we uh, see in uh, Homo ligaster to help support the idea that by this time, you had had an evolution of a reduced gut size. Uh, basically, in, in relation to the Australopithecines, uh, the Homo ligaster has uh, a narrower uh, thor thoracic region, and less space to uh, actually house that extremely large gut that we see in, for example, chimpanzees and gorillas, and that we infer uh, for the Australopithecines by the totally different uh, morphology of the um, lo lower part of the body. So you, you have here an expanding brain size, and we, we believe that there's a, uh, evidence uh, following the expensive tissue hypothesis for a change of diet. Now, uh, as we were uh, proposing this, as I said we, originally, we were talking about a change to animal-based food. Since that time, there's been a variety of uh, uh, other ideas uh, proposed, including aquatic resources, as well as an underground storage organs. And what probably happened here is there was a change to a much broader-based diet but a diet that had a much higher percentage than the Australopithecines of high quality, easy to digest food. Now, uh, what, what, one thing that's also very uh, interesting about this is that everything changes, is uh, work by Julie Lee Thorpe and Matt Spoonheimer on uh, the stable isotopes in relation to uh, some of the early ancestors, and particularly with Homo ergaster from Swarthkrons. Uh, having a uh, stable isotope uh, ratio that's quite similar to the robust Australopithecines and to Australopithecus africanus. Now, this seems to go against the idea that uh, the ergaster was eating a much higher uh, amount of animal-based tissue. But uh, what, what one of the explanations for this might be is that ergaster was actually eating animals that ate the C4 food resources or the grasses on, on the savanna and not eating the vegetable material itself. And the, 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 this is one of the issues in the next few days in the workshop that I'll be very interested in uh, discussing. 
Now, uh, what, but, but one thing that's also quite interesting about the evolution of an animal-based diet are tapeworms. And if you look at the genetics of tapeworms, human tapeworms have their closest uh, relatives to tapeworms of hyenas and African dogs. And th th this is a, a little bit of a different type of uh, evidence that might show that um, the hu humans were scavenging and scavenging, as we heard from Rob Blumenshine, in competition with uh, other African uh, scavengers. Okay, now uh, another piece of uh, evidence that's come recently is R R Richard Wrangham and his colleagues from Harvard who are talking about the fact that cooking would have had to have occurred at this very early time period. And what they're basically saying is that if Homo erectus or Homo ergaster was either eating raw meat or eating raw vegetable foods, that they couldn't actually chew enough food to support their large body sizes. And th th this is a very interesting hypothesis that many of us just had, uh, hadn't entertained because uh, there's very li little firm evidence of consistent fire usage at this point. But if you look at the small teeth and jaws of Homo ergaster and the relatively weak jaw muscles, and uh, follow uh, Rangham and colleagues' modeling, uh, that uh, here Homo erectus would have had to chew raw meat for uh, five to six hours a day to satisfy the daily energy needs. Uh, if you look at it from a slightly different point of view, they'd have to eat between uh, five and nine percent of their total body weight each day, uh, depending how much meat was in included uh, to, act to satisfy their energy needs. Now, what they're arguing is that they would need some type of extrasomatic way of beginning to prepare this food to actually ingest enough food to support that large body size. So uh, when it comes down to it, in the transition to Homo ergaster, we do think that there was a uh, significant transition to a higher quality food resource. The question is what that higher quality food resource actually was and uh, how they were, in fact, preparing that food to support that large body weight. Now, uh, what, what one uh, other thing to think about is when you have a uh, large body mass, your home range increases, here, here are humans, and uh, with the high-quality diet, uh, the, the humans would have had to have exploited a, a larger range in order to acquire that food. And uh, there's been uh, interesting work recently by Karen Stortle Numbers, where she's been modeling the energetics of bipedal walking. And what her conclusion is, is that the longer limbs are very much the same thing as the gut-brain size uh, balance. Uh, and the, uh, lo the longer limbs actually uh, contribute to energetic efficiency in bipedal walking and they cancel out the energetic effects of uh, having to move over a, a larger uh, home range. So what the, this would actually mean is that the uh, change in body proportions that we see with the appearance of Homo ergaster would serve the same effect in terms of evening out the daily energetic requirements that these uh, early ancestors would have to be coping with. Okay, now the high quality diet uh, isn't the end of the story here uh, because uh, we do, do have uh, the effect uh, on the uh, female. And uh, when we think about daily energy expenditures, we don't tend to think about the effect on the female in terms of a reproductive cycle. So uh, here we have afarensis down to erectus, down to homo sapiens, body mass, basic da daily energy requirements, how that energy re uh, requirement would increase during gestation, and also how the energy requirement would increase during lactation. And uh, what the important uh, relationship here is that the daily energy requirement of erectus, uh, when she would be in the most uh, neutral part of her uh, reproductive cycle, would be virtually the same as a smaller bodied Australopithecine female when she would be at the most expensive part of a reproductive cycle during lactation. 
uh, so the, uh, that large bot body size in the Homo erectus female would have a tremendous effect on the uh, energy that she would require during uh, her reproductive cycle. Now, there's a number of solutions to this. One is body fat. And we very uh, infrequently think about body fat when we're talking about human evolution. But what, uh, where you find body fat buildup is when you tend to have animals in a very fluctuating environment where they build up body fat during the rich air, uh, times of the year and then live off that body fat during the uh, more uh, sparse or famine uh, part of that year. And uh, with the, uh, the, the body fat would be a biologically based energy store that would help the females to counteract this very high energetic cost of their re reproduction. There's also increased social cooperation. And I, I want to explore this uh, a little bit here. Because if we look at a Homo erectus female and her energy requirements, these are kilocalories uh, per day, cycling along here, uh, she's uh, just uh, uh, had her baby, cycling, she's pregnant, uh, she gives birth, she's lactating, the most expensive part of her cycle, and she goes on uh, over a period of 8,000 days here. The same thing with an afferensis female. And you, you can see the difference in the energy requirements. If, if you look at this in terms of the cost of each single uh, offspring, uh, the cost of a homo erectus offspring would be much higher than the cost of an offspring for any of those smaller bodied females. Uh, the, well, one of the changes that's happened in modern humans is we've shortened that reproductive uh, period. So we actually wean an infant in a much shorter period than uh, we expect for Africanus based on a chimpanzee model of uh, re reproduction. The effect of this for a single offspring is that the cost of that offspring would be much lower than the cost of the offspring in the Australopithecines. And this is due entirely to the shorter period uh, in which that offspring is weaned. Now, there, there's a serious problem here because when the offspring is weaned, the offspring isn't capable of uh, gathering food itself. And uh, it would need some extra somatic, it, it would need adult help in terms of feeding itself. And if you look at this in terms of the energy requirements of the females, uh, again here you would have an afferensis cycling through here, the short uh, re reproductive period of the uh, ergaster, but you would have an extra load on that female uh, because she would be gestating, nursing one offspring, while she still had a dependent second offspring. And so her total uh, uh, energy budget would be much higher per day. But in, in terms of the cost of each uh, infant uh, through this period, uh, it would be about equitable to what you have in the Australopithecines. Now, the whole point of this is uh, the increased body size in the females uh, and uh, the suspected um, dependence of offspring uh, once they were weaned, once they came off the breast. Uh, it opens the area for other I in individuals in the society to uh, be provisioning that offspring. And it opens the whole door for cooperation in human evolution. Now, if we think about this in terms of the change of diet, where we're talking about scavenging, hunting on a, a dangerous uh, environmental uh, area. Uh, it uh, would be extremely difficult for a female to actually uh, gather enough food for her larger body size to support her pregnancies and her lactation, plus supporting dependent offspring. And it's on the, the, the basis of this, there's a number of hypotheses that have been developed about grandmothers helping older females, female kin, or uh, the males coming in to help support uh, the females in uh, the, this type of situation. And it all comes back down to uh, what's happening with this increase in body size and the expansion in brain size. Now, one last point here is we, uh, we with, with the discovery uh, and the announcement of the new afferensis baby that just came out two weeks ago in Nature, 
uh, it's helped, uh, again, remind us that we do have kids in the fossil record. And if, if, if you look at uh, the whole expansion and body size problem from the point of view of, of the infant, uh, we, we know that an infant's brain takes up about 70% of its total uh, metabolism. And we also know that in the first 18 months, it requires uh, somewhere around 9% more energy than uh, a similar chimpanzee infant would require. And there's two responses th to this. Humans have fat babies, and chimpanzees don't. And that body fat in the human babies seems to be insurance to uh, support the large brain size and the very rapid brain, brain growth in those infants. And as we see the evolution of brain size in the hominids, I, it's undoubted that we also see the uh, evolution of the fat babies. We also have slowed growth. And we, we, we know that one of the major differences between humans and chimpanzees is the ontogenetic pattern, where uh, human infants take a much longer time to grow and develop than the chimpanzees do. And so uh, if we look at three growth phases, the first two years, pan and modern human growth and weight is similar. But what happens after that is really quite spectacular. Uh, in the next 10 years, pan grows much faster, where they take uh, 57 uh, kilocalories a day for the males, 44 for the me uh, females. Humans have about half that in terms of their daily growth uh, energy requirements. Once you get past 10 years, this flips and changes, where uh, pan is re reaching adulthood, the growth slows down, and humans are just about four times as expensive uh, growing up to adulthood. Now, uh, th this change in the growth pattern may be very closely related to the change in diet and the body size changes, the brain size changes we see in Homo legaster. And uh, it's very likely that this is a way protection both for the infant as well as for the adults that are uh, providing the food and feeding that infant. And uh, this type of change uh, undoubtedly happened uh, or began to happen at this time when the brain size is expanding. So coming back here, uh, we have Homo agaster here with a brain size uh, halfway between the Australopithecines and the uh, early ho humans. And we know from the work of Christine that the growth and de development here was probably also halfway between uh, what we see in the earlier Australopithecines and the modern humans. So where, uh, where are we with this? Uh, in terms of uh, all of the species we have of uh, early humans, the story's become a little bit more complicated uh, over the last 10 years since we first proposed the expensive tissue hypothesis. For example, in Australopithecus gauri, we have an Australopithecine that looks like it has longer limbs. It may be economizing on its locomotor costs. Uh, we know from work of Will Hardcourt Smith on the feet that uh, with Homo habilis, Australopithecus africanus, and uh, Australopithecus afarensis, it looks like we have three different types of bipedal locomotion. We have experimentation with different types of body size. For example, anamensis is quite large in, in body size, where some of the other Australopithecines are quite small. Uh, we've just heard from Rob, Rob Blumenschein that in Homo habilis at Olduvai, uh, they're doing passive scavenging, uh, applying, they're uh, incorporating more animal-based food into the diet. Uh, the, 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 the way that I more or less interpret this is that Homo agaster, Homo erectus, got the combination right. They got the large body size, they got the higher uh, quality foods, uh, they uh, undoubtedly uh, uh, we're de 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 developing the social support to uh, su support their bodies and all. So uh, the, it's, uh, it seems that as the climate was changing here, you have a number of changes happening in these species, more or less experimentations. And when you get into the large body size homo, uh, they seem to have gotten the combination right. Other species d d disappeared, and they spread uh, throughout the old world. So uh, to, to summarize this, 
uh, you've got major changes in energy requirements in HOMO, uh, increase in the daily energy expenditure due to the larger body size, a shift in the allocation of energy to the brain metabolism, the expensive tissue payoff, the reduced cost of transport due to the, to, due to the increased lower limb length. And you have uh, major changes in lifestyle and life history, dietary change to larger quality foodstuffs, expansion of the home range, body composition and growth and development changes, and also social changes. And this was a package that happened to together, happened re relatively rapidly. And then once you have this complex in place, it seems to be stable for about a million years until you get changes at about half a million years ago. So uh, I'd, uh, I'd like to thank various people who've helped me in developing some of these ideas, and also, uh, the, uh, again, the organizers of the Stony Brook Symposium for inviting me to attend. Thank you very much. Final speaker of this afternoon's session. Doesn't look like Quentin Tarantino, but his movies are just as exciting. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Dan Lieberman, Harvard University on brains, brawn, and the evolution of human endurance running capabilities. Dan. Thank you so much. I would uh, also like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Richard and the uh, conveners of the symposium. It's been a wonderful day, and I'm really looking forward to the workshop, and it's, uh, it's fun to be here. And, and so I'm going to try to, uh, I realize it's the cocktail hours approaching. Many of you are a little bit low on energy, so I'm going to try to compensate for your low uh, blood uh, glucose levels without, with trying, trying to be a little bit hypothetical here. I'm going, to, I'm going to go out on a bit of a limb here, so to speak. But um, bum. Okay. So, and I should also mention that um, I have some uh, collaborators here, Dennis Bramble from the University of Utah, Dave Wakelin, my former postdoc from Arizona, and then we've added John Shea, whose work you will see uh, um, will has, has contributed importantly to, to the story. So one of the major long-standing ideas in human evolution, since before Darwin really, is the idea that humans are basically wimps, that, we, that whereas most animals such as chimpanzees and gorillas and what have it are incredibly athletic, very powerful, a chimpanzee could rip, rip a human's arm off, they're so strong. We, of course, are quite feeble and weak and rather pathetic creatures. We're not very athletic. And so a long-standing idea is that there's been a triumph in human evolution of brains over brawn, that we have, we have conquered uh, nature red in tooth and claw by using our big brains. And I wouldn't disagree with that. I think that's quite true. And, and I, I agree with the basic premise behind Leakey, Tobias, and Napier's definition back in 1964, uh, the year I was born, so it's a, a, I'm very happy about that year, um, of the idea that homo was indeed defined by big brains and tool making. It, it's, it's, it's a very sensible and reasonable idea. But I think that we've actually underestimated ourselves as athletes. And so today I'd like to argue that the evolution of big brains were inc was incredibly important, but just as Leslie said, and my talk I think follows beautifully on what she just said, that big brains are part of a kind of package deal. That, it, that, they're, that they're part of an integrated suite of changes. It also includes carnivory, larger bodies, smaller teeth, and I'll also argue athleticism. And that kind of athleticism turns out to be endurance running. And I think uh, it turns out, and I hope I'll convince you, that humans are really spectacular athletes. So to make the argument, I'll first talk about the problems of being a homo erectus, then I'll talk about running and hunting, some of the evidence, and finally the implications. This is going to be a more behavioral talk than an anatomical talk. So first, the problem of being a homo erectus. Unfortunately, Leslie's basically gone over almost all of this, um, and I'm sorry to ruin this beautiful picture by John Gertie with the silly uh, pop-up, but here we are. There's been, as you say, if you, if you step back from all the little detail, that you know, this species, that species, all the confusing stuff if you're not a member of the cognoscenti, but if you stand back and you look at the really major shift that occurred in human evolution, there's a transition, as Leslie just outlined, from smaller-bodied things to bigger-bodied things, from smaller-brained things to bigger-brained things, from things with big teeth and big faces to things with small teeth and small faces. Now, the rate and order of these changes is unclear. They didn't necessarily happen all at once, but this is a very major transition when you look at it in the broad scheme. And as Leslie just showed, and I'm glad she did this so I can sort of skip over this, this has major metabolic consequences, especially free for females, which are the ecological sex. So you go from a, a daily energy expenditure of one, a little over 1,000 kilocalories normally, or 
1,600 calories when, when, when lactating, of course, that's actually normal, really, right, to, to a much, much greater, you know, 53% increase to, to these huge uh, kilocalorie expenditures. So the question is, how did we get that energy? And Leslie's also showed this graph in a, in a, with actually data on it rather than this sort of silly um, 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 uh, extrapolation. But basically, we know that bigger animals tend to eat lower quality food with, 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 uh, with higher percentages of fiber in the diet so that chimpanzees eat, eat higher quality diets, say, for example, than gorillas. So you'd expect that humans would just simply, as we had that transition, would slide down that line. But as Leslie showed, they didn't. They, they got off that line. We've had what's called a grade shift where we increased body mass but also increased dietary quality at the same time. We pulled off essentially a physiological trick of increasing body size, increasing brain size, while decreasing tooth and gut size and increasing diet quality. So how, do, so how did we do that? Well, as Leslie pointed out, as, as, I'm just so glad I followed Leslie, um, there's all kinds of hypotheses. So one idea, for example, might be cooking. But that's a tough one because cooking there's no really good evidence that cooking was invented until about 500,000 years ago. But the one bit of the diet that everybody sort of agrees on, though what percentage it played is, is I think, is open to debate, is carnivory. And we know that starting about 2.6 million years ago, hominids are eating meat. And so we have these broken bones, and, and, and Rob Blumenshine showed you very nicely a lot of the major evidence for, for early hominid carnivory. And certainly, these early hominids might be hunt scavenging, and there's a big debate about hunting, and I'm not going to try to get into that debate too much about what's happening with Homo habilis and the earliest stuff. But I think there's a general consensus that by the time you get to 1.8 million years ago, there's some kind of hunting going on. And maybe, maybe that's not completely consensus. We can talk about that in the, in the workshop. But by 1.8 million years ago, you find in a lot of archaeological sites the bodies, uh, you, you find the bones of some pretty big animals, like a wildebeest or a kudu. And so the question is, how would Homo erectus have eaten these animals? Um, and the carnivores, of course, the way they get their meat is by being very fast and by being very dangerous. So a typical carnivore can run about 20 meters a second. You can do so for about four minutes. The world's fastest humans, the people who win gold medals in the Olympic, can run about 10 meters a second and can do so only for about 10 seconds. So it sure as heck ain't speed. Um, most carnivores have all kinds of natural weaponry, claws, fangs, enormous paws, etc. cetera. We, we lack all of those things. And so the general idea has been that it's been all about technology. Well, this raises an interesting question because actually, if you look at it, the technology is very good for get, do, dealing with an animal once you eat it, but how on earth are you going to eat, kill one of those animals with a bunch of flakes? It's actually an interesting question. I mean, this is the, this is the height of a Shulian technology here. Some beautiful hand axes, and I grant you they're symmetrical and they're gorgeous, and they've got a bunch of little sharp flakes, but I don't think this is going to bring down a wildebeest. We do have some sharpened wooden sticks. The oldest ones are about 400,000 years ago years old, and I would bet that Homo erectus probably had these sharpened wooden sticks much earlier on. So let's assume that, early, that Homo erectus, and who knows about Homo habilis, had sharp wooden sticks to kill animals. Now, of course, when we try to think about how you'd use a sharp wooden stick to kill an animal, we always turn to the ethnographic record, and that's for, for good reason, because most of us don't kill animals with sharpened wooden sticks very much in our daily lives. And so we, we look to hunter-gatherers. But of course, none of them are actually particularly useful in this regard, because they all have all kinds of weaponry. They have projectiles. They use the bow and arrow. They use spear throwers. They have hunting dogs, all of which are less than 50,000 years old. And so they're actually not that useful as analogs for our problem. And in fact, early Stone Age hunters didn't even have spears with stone points. So if you look at the, and these are very important, because they allow you to kill from a distance. So their effective range of an atlatl is about 40 meters, a bow and arrow 26 meters, a stone-tipped spear is about five to seven meters. But an untipped spear, and by the way, I just happen to have one. Thank you to, thanks to John Shea. I, I don't usually go around with a stone, with an with a unsharpened wooden stick in my daily life. Um, but imagine killing something like this, uh, using something like this to kill a wildebeest or a, or a kudu or anything. Now the problem is that when you don't have a stone point, your spear is actually not very effective. We can, we can do some experiments if we want during the workshop. But, but the problem is that a tipped spear generates a lot more, uh, it's a much sharper cutting edge, so it much more easily penetrates the hide of an animal. So you, and that it has a lot more energy once it's inside the body cavity. And most importantly, uh, a spear point, a uh, wooden spear point, um, 
then has all these sharp, jagged edges. And once it's inside the body cavity of an animal, as the animal moves, it generates all kinds of hemorrhaging and laceration. And that's actually what kills your animal. So just jabbing an animal with a sharpened wooden stick ain't going to kill it. At least that's what we think. The problem is that we just don't have any data on what it's like to do that. There are actually, no, if you actually look in the ethnographic record, people only use spears, and we're talking about tipped spears, when their animal is so-called disadvantaged. It's a word only an archaeologist could invent. But basically, it's an animal that can't move. It's either trapped because it's in a bog or a marsh or a net, or dogs are surrounding it, or it's been poisoned with some kind of, um, with some kind of, some kind of poison. So, so the only time that modern hunter-gatherers will use even a spear, a tipped spear, is when an animal is like that. Otherwise, it's obviously too dangerous to support Neanderthal is finding out from, from this woolly rhino. So I think what we need to do is we need to get some more data on, on hunting animals with untipped wooden spears. And I would suggest that if there's anybody here in the audience who'd like to try uh, doing this, we, we could arrange a nice experiment and, and, and whatever. Anyway, it follows that, <laughs> I'm sorry, the, this is the BBC. When I found this, I just couldn't resist. I mean, who would hunt naked? It's ridiculous. But anyway, that early Stone Age hunters, without projectile weapons, must have been able to get close enough to prey to kill them at short range and without high risk. If, they were, if it was very risky, they wouldn't have done it. They would have been selected instantly against. Their fitness would be lower, and they'd go back to eating berries. So here's where I think endurance running comes into the question. And endurance running is the ability, it's not sprinting, it's the ability to run long distances greater than, say, five kilometers using aerobic metabolism. And my argument is that endurance running is a safe and inexpensive and extremely reliable way for Homo erectus to have hunted. I'll also talk about scavenging as well. And that would have opened, helped hominids open a new niche that was unavailable, that of a diurnal carnivore. And so to make this argument, I'd like to talk about first how good we are at endurance running, when it evolved, how it would have helped us hunt, and how it's related to being a homo. So the first question is, how good are we at endurance running? Now, when I first started thinking about running, I was told quite definitively by my professor, Dick Taylor, that it was a silly idea, that humans are terrible runners. After all, we're slow. The maximum speed is 10, 10 meters a second for about 10 seconds. A cheetah can go 25 meters a second. We're incredibly awkward. You only have to play frisbee with a dog to find that out. And we're inefficient. Here's a graph of body mass against energy cost of locomotion. And you can see bigger animals are more efficient. And we're up there with penguins, right? We're, we're kind of <laughs> pathetic. It costs you about 50% more energy for your body mass than you actually expect for, for a quadruped. But we've been comparing ourselves to the wrong critters. We're not the sprinters of the animal world. We're the tortoises, the endurance runners of the animal world. And there's actually several good bits of data. The first is distance. So it turns out there are very few animals that will run long distances at all in any way, shape, or form. They don't like to. And why should they? And the only ones that do do it are social carnivores, like hunting dogs and hyenas. And they'll typically go about 10 to 15 kilometers, which not uncoincidentally is what, what, a, what a, a human who's training for, say, a marathon will do. Now, horses and dogs, for example, can be trained to go very long distances, but only when somebody's on them with a whip or behind them, right? And they can go as many as 100 kilometers, but they can only do so, this is an important point, only do so at a trot. They cannot do so at a gallop because they overheat. I'll explain why that is in a second. If you want to make a horse go long distance, this is a thoroughbred horse designed for running. You can only do it a maximum of about 20 kilometers a day. So that's probably the world's elite runner, OK? Can go about 20 kilometers a day. And of course, we ain't horses or carnivores or dogs. We're primates. And no primate likes to run at all. Um, chimpanzees, for example, will run 0.3% of their locomotor and postural time. I mean, when they're doing something, they'll only run about 0.3% of the time, which is not very much. And they'll go about 100 meters uh, at maximum, and they get quickly exhausted and sweaty and unhappy, and they don't like it. Um, and that's true of all primates. So we're really weird. We're unique as primates in this running ability. We're also remarkable in terms of speed. So I plotted here in blue the endurance speeds for, for humans versus various other quadrupeds. Now, this is, so me, I'm a middle-aged professor in Cambridge, Massachusetts, so I run around this speed, but there are lots of people who can run uh, very long distances like marathons at speeds up to about six meters per second. Now, a quadruped of similar body mass, a dog of similar body mass, their endurance gait, of course, is a trot, and their trot-gallop transition is about 3.3, 3.4 meters per second. That's why most of us can out, well, I don't know, most of us, even I can outrun my dog easily. I can run at her, at her gallop speed and quickly exhaust her, which, of course, makes for a very unfun run for me. I can actually run faster than the trot-gallop transition of a pony. 
I can't do it faster than the trot gallop transition of a horse, but there are people who can and do, which is why humans sometimes beat horses in marathon length races. And again, the reason is that when animals run at a gallop, they cannot pant. When you, when you gallop, you, you coordinate respiration and locomotion one to one, so you can't superimpose panting on top of locomotion, and that's why they overheat. Now, I showed you earlier that humans are more costly than, than other animals, and here we are against horses. We're about 50% more costly, but there's something interesting about human running. Notice that the horse has optimal speeds for the walk, the trot, and the gallop. And in fact, horses pretty much only like to locomote at those particular speeds. We're more costly, but hey, look at this. The human running is a flat cost of transport. In other words, it, this is the cost of moving a kilo a kilometer. It doesn't cost you any more to run three meters a second than it costs you to run four Set it backwards. It doesn't cost you any more to run six meters a second than it costs you to run three meters a second. It's an amazing thing. The only other animals that we know that do that are kangaroos. <coughs> and furthermore, although we are costly, we didn't evolve from horses, we evolved from chimps. And we know that chimps are even more costly than we are, not only for walks, but it turns out this is data that will be hitting your, your uh, book stand soon and also at a run. Finally, thermoregulation. No animal, no animal at all, is capable of running in the hot midday sun like a human. Even uh, kangaroos, which are pretty good and sweat to a fair degree, will, will overheat after one to two hours. But humans have all kinds of mechanisms. Of course, the primary one is that we sweat, we lack fur, we have also special brain cooling mechanisms, we heat dump, we're the only obligate mouth breathers, oral respirators during heavy locomotion. We have all kinds of mechanisms to cool ourselves off. Other animals that run long distances can only do so either when it's at night, when it's cold, or early in the morning or late in the evening. You can't do it during the middle of the day. They're constrained. So simply put, I think humans are spectacular endurance athletes, and this begs the question of when and why. And I don't have the answers for these, but let me speculate a little bit about it. So the first one is when. There are three alternatives. The first is that endurance running evolved with bipedal walking. So when hominids became bipeds, they also became endurance runners. The second hypothesis is that it evolved with the genus Homo. Um, and I would say, as I'll talk a little bit later on, I, the first good really evidence would be Homo erectus. And finally, endurance running evolved sometime after endurance Homo erectus, possibly in Homo sapiens. And you can imagine intermediate hypotheses between these various, these various extremes. And, of course, to test them, we need to think of see features that improve solely endurance running performance. That are, in other words, they're not related to walking. And to discuss this, you have to keep in your minds that a run is not a fast walk. In fact, if there's anything you remember from this entire talk, it's that a run is not a fast walk. Biomechanically, they're fundamentally different. In a walk, you, you, you keep your center of mass right above your hip, and you use your leg a bit like an inverted pendulum. So during the first half of stance, your center of mass rises, and you're storing up kinetic energy. And then during the second half of the stance, your center of mass falls, and you get that kinetic energy, excuse me, that potential energy back as kinetic energy. Totally different from a run in which during the first half of stance, you flex your hips and your knees and your ankle, and your center of mass falls. And when your center of mass falls, you're storing up elastic energy in all those tendons in your legs, tendons, by the way, which chimps do not have. And then those tendons recoil during the second half of stance, pushing you up into the air into an aerial phase, which is different, again, from a walk. And, um, and then during the whole time, of course, you're leaning forward, and you're basically falling forward the entire time. So what's really key about running is this mass spring gait, and also the fact that we're always falling over all the time. Now, we have been laboriously trying to document all the kinds of features that improve running performance. And this is just a partial list. And you can see the paper that we published uh, in 2004 in Nature for a longer exposition and some other papers that are just out or coming out. Um, but the point is that many of them do improve walking and running. But there are a number of features that we see in the body which I can't see as having any effect on performance in walking, but only seem to affect only would affect running in terms of the context of that mass spring gait and those stabilization problems I was talking about earlier. And I'm not going to go into these today. It's another, it's another lecture. But I just want to, just for, for fun, highlight my favorite issue, which is stabilization. Because remember I said that during a run, you're always falling forward, which is not the case of walking. You're, you tend to lean forward by about 10 degrees at your hip, and you're, you're falling all the time, which is why if somebody just brushes by you as as Zola Budd here did to, to that great American whinger, Mary Decker Tab, down she goes, and, 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 and that's typical for, for running. And of course, um, if, in a bipe, this is a very important problem if you're a biped, because you only got two legs. You've got nothing to help you if one of them doesn't work. So we have a number of these fun ones, a number of these adaptations. Uh, everybody's favorite, of course, is the butt. 
Um, and this is following up on some work that uh, Jack Stern did years ago. But humans, of course, have a large rear end. It's the largest muscle in your body. Um, and chimps have small butts. And we have particularly, we've expanded this cranial portion of the gluteus maximus. And it turns out that, um, that when you walk, so here's a person walking in my lab, and here's the EMG of the gluteus maximus. It's fun to do experimental work, just as it's fun to do field work. So field work, people go out to the field, and they get diseases, and get hot, and, and whatever. I get to stick electrodes on people's butts. <laughs> anyway, you can see that not much is doing in a walk, but in a run, big difference, right? And what's happening is that the gluteus maximus is firing just before you hit the ground. As your body wants to topple forward, it fires, keeps your body up. It's a very nice little adaptation. And one of the fun things about the gluteus maximus is that its cranial origin leaves a bit of a trace in the fossil record um, on the posterior spine of the, uh, of the iliac here. And you can see that in chimpanzee and in Lucy and in this other australopithecine from South Africa. Tiny little, it looks like they have small uh, cranial portions of the gluteus maximus. But this early Homo erectus uh, pelvis, and of course modern humans, looks like they had nice big butts. Another one that I really love is head stabilization. So here's a grad student in my lab, Campbell, who's actually doing his PhD on the foot. But he's a nice, he's, he's skinny, so he's great for putting, doing EMG work. And um, here he is running. And you can see that he's bouncing up and down. Look at the brim of his hat. Although he's, he's basically a pogo stick, right? Every time his foot hits the ground, his head should be toppling forward, should be pitching forward. But because he doesn't have the mechanism that, say, a chimp has, which is that a chimp can essentially flex and extend its neck every time its foot hits the ground to stabilize its head. He's out of luck, because his neck goes straight down. And so what does he do to keep his head from pitching? Well, we have two interesting mechanisms. One was shown by Fred Spohr in London um, that, you, of course, first, in order to correct pitching, you have to be able to sense it. And Spohr showed that the, the semicircular canals, the vestibular system, the balance system in your inner ear, um, is in apes much less sensitive than in mammals. There's a relationship between the size of the canal and the sensitivity. But that in Homo and in humans, it's back up along the mammalian line and off the ape line. This has obviously nothing to do with walking, because when you walk, you do not sub your, subject your head to any particular pitching forces. And the only thing I can think of that humans do that create, makes the head pitch a lot is running. So I think running is a clear adaptation for, for running. In addition, we have all kinds of mechanisms. And I took some of this out because I don't think I have enough time. But we have all kinds of mechanisms to stabilize the head by, by connecting the mass of the arm with the mass of the head by an elastic head-arm linkage. So chimpanzees have these permanently shrugged shoulders with these huge muscles. They have very large trapezius. They have a muscle we don't have called the adventoclavicularis. Their rhomboid muscle attaches on the head. We've basically dropped down, lowered, and widened our shoulders, lost almost all those connections, and added a spring-like ligament, which is in the mid-sagittal plane. And I'm not going to go into all the, all the details of how this works, but this, this basically enables us, when you land on the ground, to you, as your head wants to pitch forward, you use the mass of your, tra of your stance side arm to counterbalance the head and helps keep that line. And of course, it's essential that be a spring. And one of the neat things about that is the nuchal ligament, another derived feature of HOMO, leaves a trace on the skull, a very sharp, everted line on the back of the skull. You see them in humans and in Homo erectus. You actually see this in this 1813 skull, but you don't find them in chimps or in Australopithecines. When you do see them, you see a kind of slightly rounded, slightly rounded ridge. So who is the first endurance runner? Well, frankly, we don't actually know. But if you look, because there's lots of evidence we'd like to see, like, for example, when tendons got really long. We just don't really know that. But if you look at the balance of the evidence, it looks like Homo erectus is it. So that Nariokotome boy, which you keep seeing slides of over and over again, looks to me like an endurance runner. I'll be the first to admit, we really don't have enough evidence to evaluate what Homo habilis is doing, and nor do we have enough evidence to evaluate what's happening later on. So it could be that what we're seeing in Homo erectus is an incipient form of running ability that then got selected upon, or it could be that Homo erectus had it all in spades, and it's all been downhill ever since then. So let's go back to the original problem I posed, which is how would endurance running have solved Homo erectus's running problem? Here are our naked hunters again. And um, so the question is, how are they going to do it? And the answer is persistence hunting. So this is done, it does, not done very commonly, but it's done now by, by a few hunter-gatherer groups. And they always do it in the middle of the day during peak heat. And what they'll do is they'll, a runner or a group of runners will start, and they'll follow a prey. And the key is they'll keep above the prey's trot gallop transition speed. And they'll also try to run at the non-optimal speed. These people are great naturalists, and they know that animals have preferred speed. So they'll try to follow an animal. They'll have to track it all the time. They'll keep it above. They'll try to keep it galloping as much as they can. Of course, the animal gallops away, hides. They come behind. They keep it going. And eventually, if it's hot, 
and you keep it going up long enough, you will drive that animal into hyperthermia because that animal can't thermoregulate. And then it basically collapses on its own accord. And you don't need any technology whatsoever to kill this animal. So he's now going to dispatch this animal. But it's really now an act of charity after he's ran it for 15 kilometers. Um, and if any of you want to see this uh, tape and hold, this is a fantastic uh, scene from the David Attenborough's Life of Mammals. And, uh, and Louis Liebenberg, who, who arranged this, has a paper that's coming out in the next Current Anthropology, which details with GPS stuff, GPS monitors, and all kinds of great data, just it, what it is the, the Bushmen do when they do this endurance hunting. Now, there's actually is some ethnographic evidence, but of course the important point to remember is that people don't need to do this anymore. After all, we've invented the bow and arrow, we have dogs, we have all kinds of fantastic technologies which avoid the problem of having to go out in the middle of the hot day and run an animal for 15 kilometers. It's not something that most of us would like to do. But yet, yet it's still documented in Africa. It's been documented quite a bunch of times by the Bushmen. It's been shown in a number of Native American groups. Some of you may know about the Tarahumara, the world's best long distance runners. It's been shown in Australia. And um, well, if you check me over a beer, I'll tell you about my own experiences doing persistence hunting. But it has many benefits. First of all, it's very, it's very minimal risk. All you have to do is basically run for a little while, and you basically, you're going to kill an animal. It, has, it requires almost no technology. All you need is a sharpened wooden stick. Um, and it actually turns out, according to Liebenberg's data, it would be very high yield. 50% of their follows are actually successful. And if you think about that, that leads, it leads to a very, very high yield of meat per, per hunting uh, expedition. They actually have, according to Liebenberg, a 70% higher ratio, a yield of meat per run than they do when they use a bow and arrow. It also, people think, oh, no way, there's no way you do it, it's too costly. Actually, it's not all that costly. People don't believe me, but I'm going to try to show you again with this very, very graphic description. But it costs you only about 40% more energy to run than it takes to walk. So if you walk 15 kilometers, right, it's going to cost you about 750 kilocalories, which is about what a Big Mac, uh, the calories in a Big Mac. If you run the same distance, it's a little over 1,000 kilocalories, which is the Big Mac plus the fries, and I haven't included the Coke. Okay? That's actually not that much energy. It's, it's a fair amount of energy, but in, in the balance, it's not that much energy. And if you think about it, it's a hell of a lot less energy than you'd get if you uh, bring down this kind of animal. So it's even, you know, even though McDonald's is capable of loading a ridiculous amount of calories into one of their sandwiches, um, even they can't match what an entire animal will yield. But there are some costs and constraints. And it will be fun to talk to my fellow workshop, workshoppers, workshoppees workshoppers about some of these things. First of all, it has to be hot. You can't do this when it's cold. And so there may have been seasonal constraints. You need water. You need lots of water. When the Bushmen do this, they tank up as much water they can stand. And then they go on their run. Uh, sometimes they carry water with them. Nowadays, they do it in, in plastic water bottles. In the old days, apparently, they did it in eggshells. Um, and of course, you have to be reasonably physically fit. People think, oh, you can't do that. And you only have to be a young person. But you have to realize peak running performance is usually in people's 30s. And between the age of 20 and 50, most people, average joggers, schlemiels like me, are within 20% of their peak speed. But there must have been costs and constraints. First of all, it must have been hot. You can't do this sort of thing when it's cold. Secondly, in order to do long distance running, you need lots of water. And you also need salt. But that's not a problem. We know that hominids were always around lots of water. And you get lots of salt from, from blood and uh, uh, from animals. And finally, you have to be in good physical shape. Um, it turns out that's, and people often think, well, you know, people, if they weren't in good shape, they couldn't have done this kind of running. But it's actually interesting to note that average uh, performance, the peak performance for most people, comes in their 30s, and individuals from between the age of about 20 and 50 usually run with between about 20% uh, percent of their peak performance. In fact, this is something that not only men could have done, but also women could have done. And there's a nice example of that from the book Nisa, which is a, an interesting account of, of a hunter-gatherer woman. And Nisa describes something that happened when she was a child. She says, <clears throat> Another day, when I was already fairly big, I went away with some of my friends and with my younger brother away from the village and into the bush. And while we were out, I saw the tracks of a baby kudu in the sand, and I called out, Hey, everyone, hey, everyone, come here. Come look at these kudu tracks. Um, and the others came, and we all looked at them. We started to follow the tracks and walked and walked, and after a while we saw a little kudu lying quietly in the bush. It's dead asleep. I jumped out and tried to grab it, and it cried out, Ah, ah. I'm sorry, I can't really do kudu sounds. I hadn't really caught it well, and it freed itself and ran away. And we all ran, chasing after it. And we ran and ran. But I ran so fast that they all dropped behind. And then I was alone, running it, 
chasing it, running as fast as I could. And finally I was able to grab it, and I jumped on it, and I killed it. Then I picked it up by the legs, and I carried it back on my shoulders. I was breathing very hard. Phew! And then she told on to talk about how, how everybody had lots of meat to eat that night. So, so we have ethnographic evidence that not only uh, men do this sort of thing, but also women. Another constraint on endurance hunting is that it requires an open habitat. You can't do this sort of thing in very tall grasses, you can't do it in marshes, you can't do it in woodlands, but any kind of short grass savanna, a scrubland, a semi-desert uh, will work perfectly for this kind of uh, endurance hunting, uh, persistence hunting. And uh, we know that there's a very long, complex transition in Africa between about three and one million years ago as, as Africa got cooler and as habitats became more open, but it seems to be a major shift that starts maybe around 1.9 to 1.7 million years ago, and in places like the Turkana Basin and in Olduvai, we know there's a great big increase in open habitats where you could have done this kind of endurance running. Another constraint of endurance running is it requires a social system. Imagine I go out hunting all day long, and I spend maybe, uh, I go maybe 15 kilometers, and it's one of those days in which I don't actually come down, come back with a kudu. Well, I'll come back to camp, and I'll be extremely hungry and very tired, and I'll want some food. So I have to have somebody to provision for me. Um, so you need a system in which there's provisioning and food sharing, some kind of more complex social organization that occurs, say, in chimpanzees. In addition, I would suspect you also need food processing. Um, a typical chimpanzee spends about 50% of its day chewing. That's a lot of time chewing. And what it does is it fills its gut, um, and it takes about two hours for it to empty its gut, and then it fills its gut again. It takes another two hours. Well, if you had gone hunting all day, didn't, didn't have anything to eat, came back without any food, you wouldn't be able to, like a chimpanzee, sit there and fill your gut and wait two hours, fill your gut, wait two hours, fill your gut, wait two hours, um, and satisfy your energy requirements. You have to have a more concentrated source of food. So we think that some kind of food processing must also have been the case here um, with endurance hunting. We're not quite sure exactly when hunting began in the, in the, in the, in the hominid fossil record or in the hominid, in hominid evolution, and it's also important to mention that endurance running would also have been important in scavenging. Um, and scavenging is maybe the, the, the initial origins of carnivory in human evolution, and, and scavenging also, it's hard to actually imagine how hominids would have been able to, to get meat without being able to run. Think about all the major mammalian scavengers. They're all animals that run. Uh, hyenas, uh, even lions do a fair amount of scavenging. And one of the reasons for that is carcasses go very quickly. So Rob Blumenshine, for example, has pointed out that particularly in open habitats, carcasses go very rapidly. And if you don't get to them very quickly, they're essentially gone. After the lions abandon them, the hyenas will eat everything there is. So in order to have a likely uh, a good chance of getting much uh, meat from a, from a carcass, or even getting the marrow or the brains, you have to get to it quickly. And in fact, we have evidence that modern hunter-gatherers do use endurance hunting, to endurance running, in order to scavenge. So the Hadza, for example, get about 25% of their meat from scavenging. And what they do is they first see vultures in the, in the, in the air, and they know that that means there's a lion kill. Then they run to the site. They don't walk. They run there. They fend off other competitors, often using uh, again, they're using f uh, weapons that were not available in the early Stone Age. Um, and the important point is that this sort of thing can be done by anyone. Um, it's not just a, 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 you know, large packs of strong males that can do this. And again, I'm going to read from Nisa, who gives an example of how children, if running, if they have able to run, could scavenge. She says, I remember another time when I was the first one to notice a dead wildebeest, one recently killed by lions lying in the bush. Mother and I had gone gathering and were walking along, she in one direction and I a short distance away. That's when I saw the wildebeest. I went closer to look, but got scared and ran away. I called, Mommy, Mommy, come look at this. Look at that big black thing lying there. And she came toward me and I pointed. There by the tree. She looked. Hey, my daughter, my little Nisa, my little girl, my daughter has found a wildebeest. Then she said, Go back to the village and tell your father to come. So she stayed with the animal while I ran back. But we had gone deep into the Mongongo groves and I soon got tired. I stopped to rest, and then I got up and rested, and then ran and ran and ran until I finally got to the village. And then she talks about how everybody then ran back to the wildebeest site, and then they had lots to eat that night. So I can well imagine that this sort of behavior was important not just for men, but also for women. 
So we can come up with a sort of hypothetical scenario. Perhaps, say, 2.6 million years ago, hominids start eating meat at a, in, a regular, um, in a regular fashion. And maybe initially, they did so opportunistically. Um, when they came across, say, a, an animal, they would scavenge it. But natural selection works via tinkering, by make, taking advantage of small little shifts, um, uh, changes that are available in the variation uh, present in, 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 in a species. And so maybe individuals that had longer tendons or were better able at sweating so they could thermoregulate or better able to control head pitch because they had slightly larger semicircular canals were better at running in order to scavenge. And eventually, they became really good endurance runners. And perhaps by Homo erectus's time, we get really good long distance runners who are good at both diurnal running as well as diurnal walking in really hot open habitats. And it's entirely possible that there was continued selection after um, a Homo erectus, um, perhaps until the invention of projectile technology. And then, of course, people have had to run very much less since projectile technology was invented, and maybe everything's gone to hell in a handbasket since then. Now, please note that I'm not arguing at all that walking was not important in human evolution, particularly in the evolution of Homo. I think that running and walking went hand in hand. In fact, if I'm going to run to bring down a kudu, I'm going to walk to bring it home. And so running was probably an important complement to walking as part of the homo subsistence strategy. Again, a diurnal carnivore. Um, that, and, that, and it's possible that this, uh, this change in, um, in, uh, in, in, in subsistence that was partly enabled by running, but also by other features, uh, lay, l lies behind this shift that we see once we get to homo, uh, early homo, such as homo habilis and homo ergaster, where we get an increase in encephalization, the relative size of the brain. So running may have been part of the suite of shifts that occurred in the genus Homo that helped le release the constraint on brain size and that paved the way for larger increases that occurred later on. But there are a lot of unanswered questions. For example, we don't yet know almost anything about what uh, uh, a hominids, uh, early Homo, was like uh, pre-Homo erectus in terms of below the neck. We can't really say whether or not Homo habilis or Homo rudolfensis was any good at endurance running. And furthermore, because we don't have enough information from the Homo erectus skeletons, we can't really assess whether or not Homo erectus had all the full capabilities that maybe have, may have occurred later on. So it could be that Homo erectus was on the way to being a really superb endurance runner, but maybe that pinnacle was reached, for example, in archaic Homo, or possibly even Homo sapiens. We can't discount that hypothesis. But to summarize, humans are dreadful sprinters, but we're spectacular endurance runners. And that and walking was incredibly important in human evolution, but endurance running also played an incredibly important role, that of enabling hominids to become diurnal carnivores and compete with lions and hyenas and the other animals that were out there. And so running may have been part of that suite of shifts, uh, that, sh that, that, that suite of, of shifts in body form that helped make the genus Homo. And today, its primary manifestation is in part of the, the shapes of our body, and although when humans no longer have to run anymore, we do so for, for pleasure, for health, and even middle-aged Stony Brook professors, uh, I'm sorry, Brigida, uh, still uh, are capable of running marathons. And finally, I'd like to thank my, my collaborators, particularly Dennis Bramble, with whom I've uh, done much of this work, also Dave Raiklin, a former postdoc in my lab, John Shea, um, the many volunteers who've worked on this project, and a whole host of friends and, and colleagues with whom I've talked about many of these issues. So thank you very much.